Hey everyone, this is your favorite friend, Jay. And today I'm so excited and thrilled to continue my conversation with Donald Mowat, who is one of the best, if not the greatest of our time, hair and makeup artist. Let me say specifically makeup designer, because what I feel is he designs faces to show them to us. He worked with some of the biggest names in the industry. He worked with Guy Ritchie, Denis Villeneuve. He worked with uh, David O. Russell. And he also worked with multiple talents as an actors and stuff like that, like Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Wahlberg. Um, duh. Okay. He worked with a lot of people. He worked with a lot okay, of people. Uh, definitely. And, uh, today, uh, Rebecca Ferguson. Yes. Clark. You, Timmy Chalamet, uh, we Timmy said Jake, Daniel Craig. Yes, yeah, Daniel uh, Craig, of course. Charlotte Rampling, Dave Batista, Oscar Isaac. Um, and Moon Knight, he worked on Moon Knight, which is like directed by our very own Mohamed Ziab. So I'm just so excited to talk to him about that yeah, as well. Yeah, and yeah. when you think that I'm talking to the person who created the Dune world, with makeup, you just feel like, wow, Dune is becoming like a pinnacle of our generation. And also on smaller, more intimate films, which I'm really, really crazy to dig into, like Stronger, which I was talking on Twitter with my friends about. So first of all, Donald, I'm so happy to have you here. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it. And thank you for that, because it was really interesting to me. I, I don't want to say it was funny. It was interesting uh, because we you reminded me of Stronger, which I never forget about because it's it's it, when I wrote that, I really meant it. It was profound for me because and I'll tell Jake about this tomorrow. It was profound for me and seeing Tatiana Maslany's photograph. And, and we've just been talking about you and I earlier about coming from different places in the world. And of course, she comes from Canada as well, from a very different part of Canada from me. Um, but we now, I live in Los Angeles. I think she lives, I think she does, maybe in New York. But she's from the Western part of Canada and her family are Ukrainian with, oh. you know, Masani. So uh, Western Canada is very much a Ukrainian uh, because the, the history of that, long story short, was the land was, was very much uh, similar to Russia and Ukraine and Poland. And at the time it needed to be farmed. So they were giving land away. And many people who came from Europe and different countries, I mean, for instance, somebody from Lebanon or Egypt would not know how to handle that because of the cold. So they went, obviously, to people in parts of Europe and Eastern Europe who could handle it. Iceland. So people from Iceland went to Manitoba oh in the center of Canada or the center of the U.S. So, you know, Minnesota, places like that. And uh, so for me, it's really interesting. And Tatiana played in Stronger and Jake um, came to me with that project. It, it's a powerful project for me on many, many levels. I'm sorry it didn't do better. Not that it should matter, but it does. But it was it was the time was off. Timing was just wrong. Um, but the film is powerful for me today and it had a lasting impact. The story, the people. Definitely because of you like there are movies when you just see uh, a creator or someone who's an artist and they have long filmography or a work a body of work for me I wanted to dig into the things that I didn't see and then I was okay stronger I love Jake I gotta watch this one and I was blown it put me in a very very emotional state let me tell you and I was like oh my god thank you Donald because because of you I discovered this gem it's such an intense movie on an emotional level it just takes you it doesn't tackle something like the Boston Marathon bombing from, you know, like all the details, let's show. It takes it on a very, very humane level, strips it and shows this man and the woman he loves and the back and forth between them and how he adapts to the world, how he adapts to his own body. And bodies have been an issue that really, really interests me because we are bodies. We're all bodies and we're faces. And I think because you're a makeup artist, you deal with this. You put makeup and you just add prosthetics and stuff like that. So how did you tackle such an intense project like that? And how did you approach it from the beginning? Well, you know, we we um, we had a very limited, we looked at things like rust and bone, you know, with Marianne Cotillard because there was a very small, and I, I worked a lot with Jake and, and Riva uh, Marker, who was the producer, and then David Gordon Green, who was very fond of because we had a very limited budget. Obviously, it's a small film. And, uh, you know, uh, 
it was uh, something we knew there wasn't a lot of resources. It wasn't a big film and a limited prep. And I knew that we could do these legs and come up with an idea. I spoke to, I looked at a couple of makeup effects houses I'd worked with before, a couple in LA, one or two in Canada, uh, one or two in the UK. It had to obviously be close to home. There was nobody in Boston or New York really. And so I talked to uh, old friends of mine at Autonomous and said, look, we have to be able to do it for X amount of money. We do not have unlimited. We looked at uh, makeup, uh, visual effects house. I I'm completely going to forget here their names, um, but they came out of Montreal. That was a visual effects company because we had to do green socks and, you know, the whole CGI thing of taking Jake's legs out and then do a prosthetic makeup, which played a couple of times. So it was Autonomous mixed with a VFX company in Montreal um, who were actually from France. And, and so there was a lot of, of pieces, but what I really had done was Jake really as a producer and Reva let me run with it and said, you're in charge of all the prosthetic, the makeup, the hair, and you deal with it all. And I found all the people I wanted, a great crew in Boston. I'd worked there before having done, you know, Perfect Storm and The Fighter. And I, so I knew Boston. I got newer people because sometimes it's the only way to go because you can, sometimes it backfires, which it has to me more recently and other times it works. In that case, it worked because I had a great key, Nikki Plo from Boston and, and Stephanie Middlebrook and then newer people who wanted the opportunity. I, I was able to pull it together. We, we did it. And, you know, I lived in a hotel uh, mm -hmm. close by the set, not the fanciest place, and then I met Jeff Bowman and it was very life changing because he's just an extraordinary human being. And, and it really changed things for me. And I, you know, uh, met a lot of people from Boston who were part of that and they're really extraordinary people. So there's that. And it reminded me a lot of the fighter because they were extraordinary people and there were a lot of parallels. So I knew the world, I knew that world. But I didn't. And Jeff was so extraordinary. What a what a person. What a human being. Working at Costco. I know. Costco, like rotisserie chickens and um, his family and his mom. And then what I wanted to do with Jake was at first by accident and and you know, Cheryl working with me and saying, What why don't we give him a perm? Let's do a perm and and making Jake kind of look like the character, but it's harder to do with Jake because he's so specific as Jake Gyllenhaal. But what I did really want to do is I wanted to do the contact lenses on him because by taking away the Jake Gyllenhaal eyes is the thing that turned him into Jeff Bowman by taking away his blue, blue eyes. And it's the first time I've ever done that with Jake. And I'd only worked with him at that point a few times. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was within the film, changing his eyes a second time. After the explosion, I changed his eyes a second time. Wow. And I think personally, it's a stroke of genius because I remember reading once upon a time that people who have catastrophic injuries have can have eye color change. Oh. And it stuck with me and I did it. And then Sean Bobbitt, who was our remarkable cinematographer, who just never get credit. I just thought, and Sean taught me something very interesting about cinema. I mean, when we talk about cinematic and now there's so much TV, there is a big difference in cinematic makeup and television makeup. And, you know, for the snobs out there like me, don't really understand there is a big difference in cinema makeup and hair and movie makeup and hair. And I've done a lot of movies where the hero, whether it's, you know, a hero where it's, streak of dirt or blood looks like the hero and that's okay and it's great and it's artistry in itself but this wasn't this was something staggering what happened and i i changed my whole point of view in what and i did one test with jake and then sean and i spoke and sean gave me an idea about not doing a leading man makeup and that's what changed how i did jake because I decided I won't do Jake like a leading man because I did it on prisoners Definitely. and it worked it was great, but I didn't want to do it on this. And it looked shocking and it was stark and it was white, white, white with that weird, whatever it was I did. I have a picture of it here that Jake sent me years oh. ago. 
Yeah, and I keep it. I don't know why, but I, it really means a lot. So it's had a lot of impact on me. Profound. So, and Tatiana was wonderful. They were all great. And that's it. You I know, there are so much like for me, I totally get what you mean now, because for me, I'm always pissed off when it's, you know, like a Hollywood superstar or celebrity yeah. and he's there doing the regular average guy. No, you're not an average guy. You're this mega star playing an average guy. But here you could feel he's tripped down you know like especially like amy adams when you see her in the fighter for example and then you see her in nocturnal animals you can see the glow of amy adams in nocturnal animals even when she's before she got married into rich and became this art gallery owner but in the fighter you feel all the actors are stripped bare or did you do a similar experience with them because it felt so real like this were real people yeah a bit good looking but still they're real people they're aggressive people and they're just humane so much so i don't know the fighter too yeah i think it's you know there's a certain way you have to handle it and how you deal with it and in a way people think well it's just putting no makeup or less makeup. actually no it isn't it's really a specific way you do it because you still wear makeup i mean amy adams is wearing makeup in the fighter because i put it on and i remember She's wearing foundation. She's wearing eye makeup. It's just different. And it's how you do it. And it's what you lend to it and putting makeup on Jake. I mean, but it's the texture and the colors and the the base tones. And Tatiana, I, I felt like when I met her, um, I said to her, I think that you should reflect how he looks. So the worse he is, the worse you are. And the better he is, the better you are. And she agreed. And so there's moments when she's jogging, when you see her, she's so beautiful and she's healthy. I mean, who isn't? I mean, God, I wish I could jog like that. I mean, you're running and you look like that and you're all sort of, you know, glowy and dewy and you kind of walk in and your skin. And so I thought that was kind of interesting um, for me. I wish people would see the movie and, and could understand how I felt working on it. It perf I really, I can't even speak about it. It's so emotional for me going back to it that I wish we had made it now maybe yeah. or in a few years because I think when you see it, um, but it's what, seven years ago, eight years ago, seven. 2017. A, lot, a lot's happened. And I wish I could go back to those years because uh, I had way more fun back then. The Stronger had, I thought we had a great crew. I thought we had some very nice people. There's nothing I regret about that movie. And do you see a movie like The Human Stain, for example, which I love being done now? I don't think so. Who no. would watch it? It's not a great a movie. Years. And not with a director like that, Robert Benton. I was watching The Verdict last night and I thought the same thing. And even earlier films like A Taste of Honey was on. And I'm like, oh my God, when you watch that and go, one makeup artist, one hairstylist, George Frost did the makeup. It's fantastic. The hair was fantastic. Maybe one assistant, maybe. One of my favorite movies was A Patch of Blue with Sidney Poitier oh and Elizabeth. Do you know, it's about a girl who's blonde. Have you ever seen that? I've seen, I don't think I've seen it like now maybe i've seen it years before and i gotta revisit it i'll tell you that was, every time born, i think the year i was born um i remember as a child watching it and i was fascinated because looking at it now i didn't realize they actually did do a makeup effect um it was bill tuttle i think and they actually did a makeup effect which it's funny I, they must have done a lens and a little scar on her eye because she says to sydney poitier do i look okay is my face okay and he gives her some, I said, no, you look beautiful. But when you look closely, but oh my God, she was wonderful. Elizabeth Hartman, Shelley Winters plays her mean, evil mother. Wow. Um, but of course she's blind and Sidney Poitier, she falls in love with. Oh my God, I gotta revisit this movie. You're giving oh, me all the excitement. It's gonna make you cry. It's so beautiful. It's his love is blind and it's beautiful. And the mother's so mean and jealous and mean but it's a beautiful film definitely you just have to go and you never know when a good project will come into your hands like for me just discovering that i mean and yeah. then you have the covenant where you saw someone like dar salim with his well, beautiful face who is exactly different from jake who is there with his blue eyes 
I think Dar es Salaam, you know, he's he's a revelation because, well, he's not because he's been around. It's just, yeah. again, people think, oh, he's new, he's new, he's new. He's not new. He's been around. He just wasn't seen in America. Uh, you know, he's Danish, you know, uh, with his background uh, coming from the Middle East. So I think people go, who is this guy? But of course, he has been around and he's quite well known and he has an interesting background. He's a lovely guy. Uh, and their their chemistry was really superb. And Jake also has a great ability with with people, especially when there's a great connection, to lend to that, to be a star maker, to lend. You know, he did it with with Tom Sturridge. He's done it with other people in other films where he lends to that. Yeah. And and so I thought the film for me was the first time I've seen a a script like that, where at first I thought, well, I haven't seen this in a long time, like a stronger. So that gave me a lot of hope to be able to work in the, on this film and, and not make it about makeup. Cause I really did. We did think we were going to do a big burn makeup on Dar, but we didn't. And I do as much as gave us less to do. I'm really glad we didn't. Guy Ritchie really knew what he was doing mm-hmm. and we kept very simple with Jake, but you're absolutely right. And that film should that film should keep us going and give us hope. And also it's still playing in movie theaters and we're now in week four. So it's like for Jake and Dar and the whole company of the actors yeah. and the crew and, and for Guy Ritchie and his company and Warner Brothers and MGM, I'm like, wow, how movies are not dead. Exactly. This is what I felt. Let me tell you, when I watched Elvis in the movie theater last year, I haven't been to the movie theater in a long time. And then, you know, I was like, okay, skeptical. Is Elvis going to be good? Is it going to be? Because I like Elvis as a singer. And then this, you know, like really grumpy old critic from Egypt. He wrote this Facebook status. Whatever you're doing, whatever you think, leave it and go watch Elvis in the movie theater before they take it out. You're in for a treat. And I know this guy. He dislikes a lot of things. He's not the kind who just compliments. No. So I'm like, what? He really wrote about Elvis. I, maybe you should. And then I went. And for the first time in years, I think I was starstruck with the power of cinema, of making movie stars, of singing, of everything. So for me, it felt good. And then it went like glimpse and hints and pieces like that. Like when I watched Covenant, for example, this is what I felt like. Oh my God, there is still this small intimate movie in which you can, yeah, maybe Elvis wasn't a small intimate movie, but still it it carries this magic. I think the magic is gone for some reason. I don't know why. So for me to just stand in front of a movie and feel like, oh my goodness, I feel this movie is bringing me back to these vibes. This gives me hope that maybe art is not dead and we're still going to see it. Maybe fewer and in between, but I don't Mm -hmm. know. I feel this is what I felt with the covenant. Like, now it's down to these two guys. It's down to a very, very emotional story, story between two men and two different men from different worlds. And you know, like you have this noble man and you have this noble man and they're together in this hardship. So these reminds me of, you know, like when Cine Poitier and Tony Curtis were back in the days where, where it's just the two guys, you know, like together chained in this situation. So yeah, I felt with Covenant, I felt that happy. I felt, I think when I saw Stronger, I was that happy. I think years ago I saw Moonlight and I was happy. It, it happens fewer these days, but still it just gives you hope that maybe Donald will find the magic again. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny you say that because now that you, I mean, you know, it's, you're a breath of fresh air because it did. And then watching, say, The Verdict last night and and how I feel very fortunate to have worked, you know, with so many people over the years as I, you know, reflect a little bit. And I was looking at Charlotte Rampling and I've had the great good fortune to work with her twice. And, and what a r- remarkable uh, lady and really a great lady and and you know we stay in touch and I, I just love her and I wish you know uh to look at her and I was you know connecting what do they do six degrees of Kevin Bacon that thing they do and I was yeah. going look at him because I was watching James Mason in Taste of Honey and of course he was in Georgie Girl with Charlotte Rampling and Lynn Redgrave and I often look up I mean I love films I love movies and Today, uh, a friend of mine, I work with a lot of young people, um, 
yeah. whether it's you know through BAFTA or through the Academy or different programs and BAFTA LA and London and there's lots of programs I'm really interested in and, and you know getting people not just makeup and hair but filmmakers because we are filmmakers trying to get them motivated and, and I like to link people together so someone says hey I'm really interested in makeup or prosthetics and I go oh but so and so is making a little movie so why don't I get you with them and you with them and then put all of you guys together? So I kind of love that thing. It's like White Christmas, you know, with Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye. Yeah. Let's put it. So I'm that guy. I just wish I had more money that I could sort of say to people, well, let's do this. And so I took a group of people not that long ago, a young actor who plays uh, Jake and Ruth Nega's daughter on our current show uh, with another group of young people because they're all kind of lonely and don't know anybody in LA and we all went out for a bite to eat up wow. on Sunday so it was all young you know 23 24 that are all actors and young movie makers all together and then now one guy is doing makeup and effects who wants to work with an actor and he needs someone to be in his portfolio to do pictures so I said well meet this actor and get him to be in the thing that's what's missing yeah in the the sense of connectivity, maybe the networking and community networking. Okay, Donald. So okay. what I want to know from you now is you've worked in so many projects and some of them were really small, tight sets. Others were mega productions. Where did you feel like your heart was? Was it a place where you could just be the only makeup artist, makeup designer, and you're working on everything? Or is it just a big crew where you're specified to a certain, let's say, actor or character or stuff like that? Well, I guess I'm supposed to say the big, 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 big ones, like a Bond movie, which can be that way sometimes when I'm with somebody as fabulous as, you know, Daniel Craig, who really is fabulous. Um, but in the end, and the camaraderie, but I do think in the end, I'm not a small town boy, but I kind of, yeah, I think I, I don't live big. People think I do, but I don't. And I drive a very old car and I'm sensible, I hope. I like expensive clothes though. That's my deep, dark secret. <laughs> but I do, I like expensive clothes. Um, no, not expensive, good, good things. But I'm not like a gourmand, I don't. I don't buy the most, you know, my one weakness, though, I think is good clothes and shoes and things like that. But no, I don't need to be on the big films to because I have to buy the latest or I don't live like that at all. I live very simply. People are very shocked to find out that I don't do things like that. And I always ask how much things are and I'm not that person. So, no, I really would. I never got into the business. I'll let you in on the biggest secret. I never got into the business to make money because there was no money. I love making movies. That's what passion is. I will exhaust myself because I love doing it. Yeah. And I think what's really misunderstood is a lot of people love to make money. And that's, a di that's the difference. They love the paycheck. I like a paycheck, we need it. You gotta pay the bills the lights and the phone and this and the computer. But there are a lot of jobs that you can make money, but I love making the films, but I also do a lot of things for free. I'm gonna be on a call soon to help somebody make their movie for no money. And I don't get paid. I help mentor people for no money and I don't get paid. There's nothing in it for me, but I love making movies. I love help other people tell the story. If so, no, I didn't get into the business. I knew there was no money in it. When I found out my first job, I made $12 an hour. I was, my God, I can't believe I'm making $12 an hour. Minimum wage at that time was seven. It wasn't like I was making a fortune. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, I am my parents' child because my parents were both very intelligent people. And and neither one did jobs to make incredible amounts of money, but they both could have done jobs to make incredible amounts of money. And my father was very clever, very, very clever and educated. And But he chose to be a head teacher in a high school. 
He made lots of people very, very wealthy. He helped a lot of people get into the best universities and colleges and wrote lots and lots of reference letters. And he could decipher almost any book and play. And he understood Hamlet and Macbeth and Hemingway and Steinbeck, but he never made a lot of money, but he made a lot of people get to where they wanted to be. And that is the noble profession. And my mother helped a lot of people and she was a great nurse, a registered nurse for 50 years. She did her job. And uh, yes, I'd rather be on a small film because I think in the end, cr small crews are better. They're more resourceful. We pull together. We jump in and you pick up a case and go, hey, let's help the camera guy or the cameraman says, hey, Don, can you, we do this? And I miss those days tremendously. Okay, so when you have your head, let me say it a head, it's a face, and you have your palate, what what does the process go? Because for me, I'm a poet, so I know exactly what it's like to sit in front of the laptop well, or the notebook and the words came out like a purge or they're just manifesting in my mind. So I know the feeling, the euphoria, the rush, and then sometimes the whoosh when they are all out. What do you feel? Now you have this face and you're going to work on it. How does it feel like? Oh, before I answer that, when you write poetry, do you write in English or Arabic? Both. Your po Both. That's fascinating. Thanks. That's fascinating. And also in Egypt, sometimes in French too, right? Yeah, sometimes. but my, my French is, tr I, I try to be French because I love French movies and French music so much. And my mom is a big French songs fan. Like she would just blur them out to me all the time so yeah i my try first french teacher, by the way i'm starting my first french teacher in, in kindergarten was from egypt oh wow okay now we are so we have a lot of francophone here so yeah i totally get my it very, and that would be and i'll tell you the year oh my god i won't tell you the year but <laughs> it, was in, it was in a school in montreal a kindergarten no like a nursery school with my best 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 friend ever karen atchong deanne it was her name, but she was from, I always remember because I said, Miss Mademoiselle, I can't remember her name. I wish I could. Where Where are you from? And she told me. Oh, wow. And I remember always. So that's how, how I remember. But anyway, um, so I digress. But um, I just forgot what we were talking about. We're talking about the, the process, because for me, I was telling oh. you my process. You're oh, I'm so, so yeah. Sometimes I'll have a great idea. Like right now, I'm working with you know beautiful Ruth Nega, and you know she'd been in loving and and all these wonderful things, and she's Irish but Ethiopian, and this sort of beautiful unusual face that's Irish but Ethiopian, and so she's all these things, and 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 Peter Sarsgaard and Jake Gyllenhaal, who's producer, and it's interesting because some days I go, well, no, she shouldn't be like this. And I'll have all these ideas in my head and I, I bought the makeup and what I wanted to do. And then I try it, but I kind of knew almost right away what I was doing with her. I, I felt it should be warm. I've seen her made up on red carpet. And I really usually 90% of the time don't like the way 95% of actresses look on red carpet because it's not my vibe. That's, that's moi personnellement. It's a person, you know, it's, yeah. What a, it's a, it's a thing. It's a, it's an idea. And I go, it's not my vibe, but others think it looks great, but I don't like crazy eyebrows and lashes. And so I go, but for this character, I think the look is really warm and, and beautiful and corrective and not too soft, but it's not period. It's not Victorian. It's modern. But so I had an idea of what the makeup was and then whatever correction we're doing, and then the lips and everything else. But I chose it, and then there were a few things I picked, and when I put them on Ruth, they didn't work. And you go, oh, but that's because that's like shopping on a catalog or shopping on the internet. You go, oh, what color of yellow is it? What color of red is it? Well, never buy a red lipstick online, never buy pink or orange, because it means so many things to so many people. And it goes for men as well. You can say, well, I just want to give him a little warm or maybe make his stubble look more defined or make his brows look stronger because he's this type of man or maybe correct something. You never buy makeup online without knowing the product. Um, and other times I want to do, a, a, you know, working with faces I don't know. I need to do them a few times.
There are other people I've done the face many, 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 many times, and I know it won't work. Wow. And other times I just know, like on Jake, I know how to make him look sick. I know on Stronger by putting too much yellow into his skin, I can make him look like he's suffering. Stronger, making him look opioid induced when he's in pain after the amputations, the pain of that. And then when the nurse said to me, oh my God, how do you make him look like that? He looks so sick because that's how you look. And then the, the gravitas of it, or I don't know, making skin match the Zendaya and Timmy and Dune part one. How do you make it match from the desert of Jordan of the Wadi Ram to Budapest in the, in the studio? So Sometimes I have an idea and it works. I think on Dune part one, I tried a lipstick, a natural no makeup look. It just didn't work. And then I found something that did work on Zendaya and it looked beautiful without looking like makeup. So I, I don't know, you try a tattoo, you try that thing on Dave Desmalchin or the bald Harkonnen look and it worked, but I didn't know if it would. And but process of elimination sometimes when you're rushed and you just have to quick that's what i wish my younger teams would understand sometimes they're too when you're young you you want it perfect and you're afraid and you're anxious and anxiety is okay you have to sometimes just go be free just be free and and i had this conversation with jake and one time with his sister wonderfully talented maggie oh. to say sometimes you have to be free but it takes confidence to be free or you work with the old, well, old timers, people who are no longer working, who just retired. I mean, one of the best actresses I ever, ever, ever worked with. And the funniest and the nicest was Kate Nelligan, who was, when I look back to think of her in Prince of Tides playing the mother of Nick Nolte. Amazing movie, by the way. But she was hit, played his mother, but she's 10 years younger than him. She played the mother in both the flashbacks and modern. Yeah, she was made look older. Beautiful, Kate Nelligan. She was in Frankie and Johnny playing the waitress next to Michelle Pfeiffer. Love Her brilliance movie. was astounding. Nobody knew where did she come from. Was she British? Was she American? Was she Canadian? What this remarkable actress? I. I just knew when I worked with her on a couple of things that I just knew how to do her face. Then you get incredible people like Stellan and Dune Part One or, you know, Josh Brolin or somebody who will actually look in the mirror and go, hey, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of the scar? Or are we going to do? Because they're connected to the character and they have some training. I know what you mean. So yeah. Rebecca Ferguson, was she part of, because I felt you did a lot of work with her, although she looks naturally beautiful and pale in Dune. Yeah, I, I love her. I really... I absolutely love her. I adore her. She's exquisite. I mean, there's a, a lot of fun uh, about working with her and her ability to let me do my job. Uh, obviously, for part two, which we're not really talking about, but for just one big thing was recreating to match her and the amount of work I had to do with great friends of mine at Paul Edmonds and Zoe to here to match the hair and pieces and color and because three years later and getting that hair brought back to how it looked. So matching was trying to find a team and all that stuff. But in part one, um, she allowed, you know, the difference in age was, you know, we couldn't age her significantly, but she's not that much older than Timmy. She's, you know, 12, 13 years older, but the significance of also making her look older, but not matronly, but also she's a concubine. Very. She's not meant to be, 30 years older than him. She's realistically meant to be 16 years older, maybe. Yeah. Is real in the real world, let's talk about this for a second too. In the real world, one from our time, well, my time, generally women were only about 17, 18, 19 years older than yes. their first child. If somebody was 21 or 22, you'd be like, where's Good. the first one? Yeah. Oh, well, it was. Right? So in the in the world of Dune to be the mother uh, and so it made sense and it was a balance keeping her hair very conservative and and not sort of sexy um, and then the makeup so I did a lot of work and I spent a lot of time on both parts with Rebecca and the the 
tattooing and all of that. And anyway, uh, but she's a delight to work with. Just simply delight. Yeah. Okay. So um, for me, the idea of you work with faces, but you also work with directors. Do you feel that there are certain directors who are collaborating with you to bring out something like, which director do you feel was the person who brought out in you, did this collaborative work that you're telling me? Now I feel like I know Donald. I know what Donald loves. He loves the collaborative area, oh, yeah. the collaborative sense of it. This is mm -hmm. art to him, going out, getting dirty down and working on this piece of art that. to make it. This is why he made Stronger. This is why he made The Covenant. Yeah. This is why he made The Older Ones. So which director got that driving you? Well, I mean, of course, when I think back of the early Denis Villeneuve, uh, when I first met him, Prisoners, I think, and, and you know, the creation of Dune Part One, uh, for me, was just incredible. But really, Blade Runner, for me, meant a lot. Blade Runner meant a lot to me. Did you um, love the original? So much. I use it for reference to so many things that I do. Always have, always will, what they did. And my, you know, uh, Marvin Westmore, who was the original makeup designer. I don't compare. I never do. People no. keep asking me. I don't compare them at all. Uh, Dune, I, I was never a Dune. It's not my thing. I, I mean, I loved working on it. I love the actors and the people and, and I adore them actually. And my, my original crew, particularly and my co-designers, Lube Larson and Ava Von Barr. Um, I would say, you know, meeting and working with Denis on Prisoners brought a great deal. He challenged me creatively to do the work I did on Paul Dano, on Jake, on the girls, on Maria and Melissa Leo. And it was very good. And, and uh, Sicario, incredible experience. And, and of course, Blade Runner, um, you know, five movies with him, incredible, you know. Um, but a lot of new people, new producers, new, new. Uh, so I think that also changes if things get bigger and move bigger. I, I think for me, Prisoner Sicario was, I think, one of the greatest experiences and one of the best films I have ever, ever worked on. And for me, there are personally my favorites for him too. Uh, in Sandiz, of course, I loved it too. But I also love Prisoners and Sicario even more. Like if I'm saying my opinion, you know, like because these, yeah. these are my personal choices. Like for and me, of Sicario. Course I have you know, my lifelong friends of, you know, Roger Deakins and James Deakins, his wife, and they are lifelong friends of mine. And um, you did good. You did good. So, OK, what I I don't think I'm really there is a lot that I want to talk to you about, but I know your time is limited. However, it's I've just, got to prep for tomorrow. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. OK, so just what I have in mind, like now you've done a lot, you've accomplished a lot. Do you ever have like, OK, from a Makeup artist point of view, do you ever have a face that you feel like I could have done, I could do this? Like I could do what if this came under my table? What am I gonna do? Like, do you ever get this really. moment? Probably not anymore. I think when I look back at other films, I think, oh, that was an interesting choice. Sometimes now I look back because everybody's a critic, but now when I look back at things, I go, God, that must have been really hard. Or you know, everybody's a critic until they've been in that situation. And then you think, oh, my God, I have no idea how they did it or how hard that must have been or how uh, certain types of actors can be very, you know, for their own reasons or their own how they work. It's not always easy. It's their face. They want to have a decision. I think it's very interesting that somebody would say, well, makeup or whatever, makeup hair, but they wouldn't say it to the DP. You see what I'm saying? Definitely. Or the designer, not so much. I think there's very much the hierarchy of the industry has changed tremendously, but not so much as far as the, the hierarchy of makeup and certain departments has been diminished, absolutely been diminished. And I think that's Instagram. I think that's the makeup and hair people have allowed that. I think the big chairs they have, I think people uh, being sort of the... Uh, have allowed that to happen to some degree and not pushing back on people, um, pushing back on AD departments, on PAs who, you know, I think are a bit up themselves. Um, so uh, yeah, and I certainly do push back and I think that annoys people and and shocks people a little bit, but anyway. You're a kind of fighter. Yeah, oh, that's who you are. 
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to let them oh. have it. <laughs> let them have it. That's wonderful. This is what I felt. Yeah. Donald's a fighter, guys. Oh. All right. I just I love talking to you, Donald. You're just amazing. And I hope I can talk to you more and more when we'll others do it again. We'll do it again. Clean. When things okay. come. Thanks so much for having me. Have a wonderful, have a great week. Thank you. You too. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.